Okay. So we are going to start. Okay, can I have your attention please? Okay. So we are going to start with virology. We are still uh, on some of the viruses. And um, as I've been talking over and over again, uh, development of antiviral drugs has been a challenge. And uh, we talked about the replication of viruses. And uh, one of the success stories that you can see, especially in this uh, particular drug, and that is for infant, especially at high risk, respiratory syncytial virus. And Abbott actually came up with uh, this monoclonal antibody. So it's an IgG1K. It is called a humanized monoclonal antibody. It's produced by a recombinant technology. And the whole idea is, if you remember, the replication of viruses that it is directed towards an epitope uh, in the antigenic site of F protein. That there's an A antigenic site on F protein on respiratory syncytial virus, and this particular antibody is targeted towards that, as you can see, uh, is called Synagis, and there are other names for that as well. So we'll continue with RNA viruses. Today I'm going to talk about. Uh, at least four different viruses which are closely lumped together and most of you will be familiar I'm pretty sure of childhood vaccination one of the vaccinations that we give to kids is called MMR measles mump and rubella but don't confuse rubella with rubiola rubiola is measles and uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit of oversight of what the recommendations are and what are the significance of vi uh, vaccination. And then again, a para-influenza and respiratory syncytial virus called RSV. This is the most current information that I could download from CDC website as of this morning. And you can see from here, I want you to pay attention to uh, some of the important aspects that you as a pharmacist may be asked or you should be familiar with that. For example, who uh, recommends these vaccinations? What is the body there that you have to believe in? Of course, it's not going to be Wikipedia or Google. Well, you can look for Google, of course. But you can see at the bottom over here, there are three major authorities that would give you recommendations. They are, of course, U.S. Department of Health and Human Sciences, CDC. We have American Academy of Family Physicians, and we have American Academy of Pediatrics. So these are legally responsible and for recommendations. And then you can see uh, from birth till four to six years of age. So these are all through. And I don't intend to talk much about vaccination, but I'm pretty sure you may have a lecture in P2, P3. But what I want you to pay attention is that some of the viruses that we are discussing today uh, occupy the whole scenario of vaccination that we have. So if you look at Hep B, you will see Hep B at birth, and then one, two months, and two different doses of Hep B, and there has to be a gap there. And they, there is an uh, other respiratory viruses, as you can see over there, DTAP for, stand for diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. And there are booster doses for that. And we have H influenza, especially B strain. We talked about that. PCV, this is again a pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. Pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, we talked about bacteria. IPV is inactivated polio vaccine. So we have an inactive polio vaccine. And then again, uh, if you want, you can deliver influenza on a yearly basis, depending upon. Uh, pediatrician's uh, recommendation. Then again, uh, we have MMR, which I'm going to discuss today, measles, mumps, and rubella, and varicella. And varicella is herpes zoster virus. And then again, keep in mind 
that there are two different doses for that. And the recent studies, I was looking at it probably last week as well, that those people who have had only one dose may have a problem with therapy zoster as recurrence and reactivation of the virus. So it is not 100% protection, but still CDC thinks that uh, you have to have at least two different doses of varicella. And then again, uh, I think last year or before last, a was not there, but now we do add hepatitis A as well in the list of vaccination being recommended. So if you are interested, uh, there's a good table for you. You may not need it for this lecture, but obviously as we move in virology, you should expect some questions uh, from this table. And I want you to pay attention for chickenpox, then again it remains at the top of the list. And I gave you the story as well, chicken pox was considered as normal. So grandmothers and mothers would tell you whether their babies have had chicken pox. And then they think, they thought that then they will have a lifelong immunity, provided that uh, the child recovers. And again, the other important thing that I want you to pay attention is that disease spread by. So you can see mode of suppression over there, and you'll see the name of vaccine and the complications and symptoms. But especially for viruses, the most important complication uh, is involvement of neurons, encephalopathies. That remains the most dreadful thing because the viruses have a property of latency hiding away, sleeping in the nervous system. And that's why it used to be a very high mortality for the babies, especially when they have to ha have the chicken pox. But obviously, uh, chicken pox, pox itself or vaccine should give you a lifelong immunity. The only chance that you may have it is a reactivation or virus coming out of latency if your immune system is suppressed or you're stressed out. And then again, you can see Hep B, flu, measles, mumps, pertussis, polio, pneumococcal, rotavirus. So there's another virus added because there's a big epidemic coming up and it really makes people very uh, sick, especially babies. So you have to throw up and lose the you know, fluids, and it's very painful in terms of having your whole immune causa, gastroenteritis, uh, in cramps. And then again, tetanus is there. And many a time in some of the countries, uh, also keep in mind that they give MMRV. So they put three vaccines plus they add varicella for protection from shingles. Now the questions you may have, again, in terms of RNA viruses, it, it, I want you to understand the um, single stranded viruses as compared to the other type of viruses that you have. So in this case, uh, emphasis is on negative strand RNA viruses, and this remains to be a incorrect statement. There are quite a few viruses that we normally see in clinical practice, paramyxo, rhabdo, orthomyxo, phylo, bunyan, arena. I don't want to spend much time on all of them, but some of them do play a significant role. We'll just concentrate on paramyxo today. Paramyxo has three genera, morbili virus, paramyxo virus, and pneumo virus. Again, pneumo makes your life easy because you can tell that it's gonna affect lungs. And if you talk of human pathogens, because remember, people in industry, people in um, agriculture, they will be working on viruses causing problem to uh, the crops. And people in veterinary are interested in uh, viruses causing problem to the animals. But for this course, we just want to limit ourselves to human pathogens. So uh, morbili virus, that includes measles virus, paramyxo virus, that includes para influenza and mumps virus, and within pneumoviruses, there are a list of them, we have respiratory syncytial viruses. I gave you the drug that was there. And then they came up with a newly discovered but relatively common meta virus. Now, also keep in mind, I want you to build up this uh, ability at least to understand viral infections. And uh, remember, so far the theme has been skin involvement, mucous membrane involvement, and mucous membrane could be of gastrointestinal tract, could be genital tract, could be respiratory tract, and then again, neurons, nervous system involvement. So again, uh, measles virus, as you can see from here, 
uh, it's going to give you a macular papular rash. That's where the rubiola comes from. Rubella, rubiola comes from. As compared to parainfluenza, where your mucosa of the respiratory tract is involved. And uh, for mumps virus, mumps again has very significant uh, kind of affinity to attach to your salivary glands. So if your salivary glands are inflamed, 99% chances are it's going to be mumps virus. And then again, the respiratory sensitive viruses do cause mild upper tract respiratory tract infection and uh, pneumonia in adults. And as I said earlier, when I was teaching you bacteriology, any adult having a normal immune system should not have pneumonia. If an adult has a pneumonia, there's something going on and we need to figure it out. Okay. Now the next slide will uh, seem familiar because I'm going to use it in every virology slide. Again, you can see attachment, penetration, uncoating, macromolecular synthesis, transcription, translation, assembly of viruses, and then budding of the virus. So the same sequence we've been talking over and over again. But the most important thing in this case, you can see that when there is a respiratory virus and it absorbs and fuses with the plasma membrane, especially if it has a negative sense RNA, then the rest of the stuffs in terms of transcription and translation basically are happening in this case uh, within cytoplasm. So that's the significance part of that as compared to some of the viruses that may have that going on in nuclei. But again, the upshot for that is that uh, for any enveloped viruses, as the viruses are using your enzymes to make the different components of their viruses, uh, especially the envelope portion you can see are being made on the self surface, especially for the glycoproteins, which are like gluey, sticky molecules that are there. And these are the glycoproteins that your immune system is going to see and make antibodies against. Okay? And again, you can see in the end, the complete virus bursts off with an external port picked up that. And if you saw the impact slide, I gave you the A antigen of F protein that you have a very specific IgG1K antibody targeted towards that. So if you look at the structure of a, a typical uh, paramyxovirus, apart from the, the nuclei which is there, you will see that it has uh, polymerase proteins. And then again, uh, it has a capsid. You has a helical capsid having NP protein. And I want you to pay attention on those spikes. So these are those spikes. Uh, like H and N spikes. So H stands for heme agglutinin and N stands for neuroamidase. And you can see that especially the pink color M protein. So these are some proteinish parts which are visible to the immune system. And if you don't, even for MSC class 1 and MSC class 2, they're going to be broken into smaller chunk and presented to the T cell to mount an immune response, whether it be a CD4 cell-mediated response or an antibody response. So in this case, uh, there is a M protein, the pinkish one, and then there is a green one called F glycoprotein, and these kind of spike out of the envelope. And these are those struts, those attachment molecules that these viruses have to attach to the respective cells which they are going to penetrate and cause infection of. Now, as a family, if you look at the family of whole paramyxovirus, and uh, as we discussed earlier as well, number one, uh, I told you that uh, the virus replicates in cytoplasm as compared to some viruses uh, applicating in nucleus. And then again, uh, the virions especially uh, penetrate the cell by fusion. So what it means is they kind of fuse into that. And once they fuse into that, they may or may not have the outermost covering. And then uh, when the cells go and infect and kill a particular cell, they go from one cell laterally to the other cell. So they don't have to go out and be released. 
So this kind of pathology, uh, which happen in cytopathology, they keep on recruiting cells that they damage. So you may see a, a one virus killing 10 cells and they form a conglomerate. So they kind of condense them together. And if you were to look at like rash scraping, you will see that they look like multinucleated giant cells. So they look like multinucleated giant cells if you were to look under the microscope. And then again, as we discussed earlier, uh, the infection is transmitted by respiratory route uh, because of the, uh, the nature of the attachment, and especially for H and N portion. So if you look at, uh, in the previous slide, if you compare, this is basically a legend of what was given in the previous slide. So the, uh, the upshot of that is that the enveloped viruses carry those glycoproteins, M proteins, and F proteins, and other important markers that serve as attachment. And they serve as tools for these viruses to have special ability to go into the cell and cause infections. Now let's begin specifically with measles virus. And you can see in electron micrograph, measles virus is budding off the cell. Now, measles virus, again, uh, is important because this is one of those viruses that cause rampant skin infections. So you've got skin rashes and eruptions. And many a time, especially for measles, so whole body is involved. Not only skin is involved, but mucous membrane is involved. So you can imagine uh, how painful is those uh, rashes on the skin, and especially if it happens on the oral mucosa which is very sensitive area, you will see, uh, especially for the kids, very painful conditions. Now again, uh, for Bezel virus, again, we talked about the family. Uh, you will see that it has a RNA. There's an RNA there inside, and then there is a bilipid bi membrane outside, and then you have these specific structures that are protruding out. For example, you can see over here, there's a Hemagglutinin. And hemagglutinin is important because when I talk of flu virus, I'm going to talk about H1N1. So the H1 is hemagglutinin. And then you can see from here uh, some of the matrix proteins, M over here, and some of the phosphoproteins. So these are some of the proteins. And then again, the whole idea is that these proteins attach to those cells. So they are specific adhesion molecules on the cell surface. And you can see on the right hand side, this is a typical cell and the virus goes and attaches through those receptors expressed on the outer surface to those molecules, for example, CD46 and CD150. These are cluster of differentiation. And why do we need to know that? Because remember, for developing antiviral therapy, we either mute uh, the receptors on the virus or we mute the receptor on the cell. So we can have an a antibody that can block and then block the penetration of that virus into the cell. But once it goes into the cell, again, you can see typically the same process. Uh, synthesis of macromolecular and everything is happening within the cytoplasm as compared to and also keep in mind, the other day I said some of the components are too large to be transported uh, into nucleus because nuclei have nuclear pores. If you remember your cell biology, the nuclei are, have so specific size pore and something has to fit in, especially it goes like messenger RNA penetrates into there and then guards the activation. And again, on the right hand side, you can see budding off of the virus and then virus is ready to go and in fact, so that's like pathogenesis. And uh, what it looks simple when you talk of one measles virus, but uh, when you have to do like 10, 20 viruses, you may see pathogenesis different in different type of viruses. Okay. Uh, disease and viral factors. This is an enveloped virus. This means it's gonna be easily inactivated by dryness and acid. 
And the other important thing I must have said in herpes, I must have said in herpes zoster as well, and I'm pretty sure that you got a sense of it, that uh, pain comes first and rash follows. So in this case, also contagion period, there's a period when the person suffering from those viral infections is contagious. And the problem with that is that the person would not know that he or she has that disease and he will be shedding viruses and giving to others. So that's what it means that before the actual symptoms appear, the patient has a contagious period. It's limited to humans. Uh, there is only one serotype. So if I tell you if there's one serotype of a particular virus, what does it imply? Very good candidate for a vaccine. Simple. If there are more than one serotypes, how many serotypes are going to make, you're going to make vaccine against? That's what the problem we had with flu virus. It mutates, change every year, so we have to come up with a new vaccine every year. If a particular virus has only one serotype that's causing problem, your job done. That virus is going to be good. Okay? Once you get it, you get immunity. Uh, it's lifelong. But again, uh, also keep in mind that uh, just because I told you, just because it's written in the book, uh, viruses can change their mind. They can come up with them, like bacteria. That's what we used to think for bacteria. That is the same bacteria, same antibiotic, but antibiotic resistance coming from. So we do see now the viruses are changing. That's why our vaccinations are failing. So keep that in mind. So I'm not going to go in that detail today. But for all practical purposes for your class, uh, that's what it is. As I said, uh, I say it every day, that I uh, just want to make sure that you get the uh, incidence report as of today. And interestingly, I don't know if you are familiar with that, just like CNN and all those news channels, they keep on broadcasting what's happening all around the world, and so does CDC. So CDC has this incidence report every day, televised. So they would say, okay, what's the incidence of measles today? What's the incidence of such and such today? Now, uh, this, as of this morning, and again it says, a incidence cases in the U.S. Now, I just told you the vaccine is perfect. This is USA. Everybody gets vaccinated, hopefully. But still, the problem exists. And interestingly, in Illinois... So in Illinois, Arizona, California, there is still a high incidence of 2015 measles. Can somebody make a wild guess as to why would that happen? Say it again. Crazy parents. He's saying crazy parents not taking well. Immigrant population. That's another issue over here. Because the immigrant population will come and they will provide you their vaccination report. And for example, many of them may not have the second dose of that particular vaccine. Many of them, as I said earlier as well, may have had that vaccine, but the cold chain was broken. By the time it was delivered to that particular hospital, they didn't make sure it was to be kept. So mere having that vaccination may not be enough. So that's something that you need to challenge on your own, and to yourself, and to, to all the people that may show little bit of uh, odd, you know, or a, an outbreak of one particular disease. Okay, now of all the diseases that are highly contagious, measles is highly contagious. It's just like flu. So uh, people working in Illinois in hospital in pediatrics with the child care, the kids, you can imagine that there are all the chances in the world for you to pick up through the respiratory droppers. So that's a social contact that you have with the babies, with the people, that you breathe in the same uh, room, so to speak, or in the ecosystem for some amount of time. So you, it's good enough for you to acquire that virus. Again, it has a liking for epithelial cells. Once it goes into the epithelial cell, it will go into the blood, and you have viremia. Okay? And the virus basically has an ability to uh, divide into your conjunctivi, that's an outermost layer, mucous membrane of the eye. 
respiratory tract, urinary tract, lymphatic system, blood vessel, and central nervous system. That's what should ring a bell in your mind. Because I just want to make sure that viruses should not be taken uh, lightly, especially for the babies, if they have a rash. Rash with fever is something that the baby has to be taken to ER ASAP. Because rash with a fever is an emergency, especially for the babies. And uh, of course, because of the in because if you are late, for example, one of the problems with the uh, viral infection is that if you are late and you don't initiate the therapy in time, then the process of healing will be delayed. So the other question is that what causes the rash? Rash basically is a T cell response. So the rash is a T cell response uh, to the virus infected epithelial cells. And then again, uh, since the T cell response, so cell mediated immunity is important. And um, as I said earlier, that the sequelae of the involvement of central nervous system is that you can see, uh, especially for immunopathogenesis, we call post-infectious measles encephalitis. So virus uh, would always be there, as I said earlier. All you need to figure out is that you don't want the virus to be latent into your central nervous system, especially in the brain. If it does so, then we have, especially for measles, the most dreadful thing, and you don't find any, any exam of mine even that I have not asked that. It's called SSPE, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. So that is a dreadful story of the kids, especially in Illinois, because of any reason, as he said, the parents didn't get their child vaccinated or immigrant population and so on and so forth. And they have that panencephalitis, whole of their brain is involved. If you look at the, uh, for example, you are working in a pediatrics ward, and of course, as a pediatrician, you cannot say, I'm not going to look at this patient. So there's always a challenge. So that's like ethical duty of a physician. That's what you have this white coat ceremony, and so does the physicians have. They will abide by the rules and regulations. They would not say no. They will try their best to protect themselves, wear the gloves or whatever. But uh, many a times, pediatricians themselves uh, usually say they have to have a good immune system. So you get inoculation by respiratory system. The virus divides, goes into lymphatics, and you have viremia. So it's in your blood. Now what happens after that? Simple physiology, something is in the blood, it's going to go where the blood takes it to, right? So it can go in your conjunctivi, the irises, uh, the eye. It can go to respiratory tract, urinary tract, small blood vessel, lymphatic system, and CNS. That's what we see a typical clinical picture. And then again, immune system will come and fight it off. And the only place you will see the immune system fighting these viruses is your skin. Because rest is taking place inside the body. So you'll go and fight T cells and you see a rash. So that's what that's basically is uh, a protective response of your T cells fighting off. Now, what are the four possible consequences? Number one, the left hand side, you recover. Your immune system is good enough. Give a pat to your immune system, you have a lifelong immunity and you survive. If, God forbid, if there are problem, you have post infectious encephalitis. So remember, the infection is over. The rash is gone. The fever is gone. When the mother thought everything's okay with my baby, and all of a sudden, the baby gets post-infection encephalitis. So that's the dreadful thing. If basically that doesn't happen, then you may have a little bit of a mild form we call subacute, which means subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. That happens especially when there is a defective measles virus infection of the CNS again central nervous system and then finally as used to happen before we started vaccinating people there is no resolution of acute infection and the babies have a compromised CMI leading to the death of the babies now if you look statistically other than the recovery all three options are rare outcomes but remember that the rare outcomes are the ones that we deal with, the physicians deal with. Not everybody comes to the hospital. Not everybody goes and seeks physician's advice. So they deal with rare things. So they have to know what the rare things are. Okay. Now, 
Two things are said about measles virus. One thing is that, like any virus, once you have a viral infection, it's going to stay in your system forever, latency. Now, what do you need to know about that is that, uh, especially encephalitis, that is the brain tissue getting infected. The other thing is neurons, because there is a, a rash there, there is an itching there, there is a sensory pain there, and then these neurons, since the, for example, skin is richly supplied by neurons, especially sensory neurons. So these sensory neurons will take this virus along the spinal cord up to the sensory portion of the brain. So this means that these viruses find a track. So they will kind of ride onto those neurons and travel up. Bacteria would not do that. Bacteria needs to swim. It has to have that uh, flagella, you know, cilia for attachment. It, it needs to kind of go and swim. It needs uh, fluid, it needs tissue. But viruses, since they are small, very, very small, so they would kind of move, sit on top of uh, these nerves. For example, I, I'm going to give you one example. So you can see from here, uh, there is a skin rash. And then the viruses, because the size is very small, and then it will go down and travel along the nerve path and sit on top of the neurons. They'll sit on top of the neurons. Now, the questions you may ask is that, uh, and again, this is a subject of study as well, especially for uh, myelin sheets. It's going to go sit on the myelin sheet and then again move on and track. So you can go and track them. And as we talked about the homing concept in immunology, where initially where there is an immune response and the cells get activated, they basically come back to the same site where the, the immune response was elicited. But in this case, you may pick up this virus, for example, from your tonsil. That's the most important because you're breathing in, your tonsils are there, the tonsils will pick up this virus and it goes into tonsil and neurons, and then they can travel all over your body. And so that's the most important thing, because um, when we used to ask patients, what kind of pain do you get? So they would just, some of them are very descriptive. So say that somebody has taken my nerve and is cutting with the scissors. Or some would say they is going and setting a fire to that. So that's very painful in terms of, uh, of the pain. Then also remember that uh, three lateral spinous thalamic tracts are there that usually go together. If you know your uh, anatomy, I don't know whether you were, you were taught sensory system, right? So what are the three tracts uh, that go together into the brain in terms of sensory sens sensations? What are the three pathways that go together for your sensation? So they travel together. So they kind of partner with each other. What are the three sensory tracks? Pain, touch, and temperature. It's called spinal thalamic tract, pain, touch, and temperature. So this mean is that if you have some viruses that affect your neurons, you have a problem with the pain, you have a problem with the touch, and you have a problem with the temperature. So these are the three major because the paths are going together. That's why there are many clinical conditions that we see these all three these different sensation told the story. Now again, uh, you can see incubation, inoculation, respiratory tract. So you can see first seven days, there's a infection, but no symptom. So this is called incubation period. And then again, you will see the, all the symptoms come when viremia comes. So if I was to look at this picture over here, I would say incubation period for a week. The patient is infected. The patient, baby, is passing on this infection. That's why I used to wonder, mothers have a very strong immune system. If they so they pretty much are so close that they have to have a good immune system, especially in the incubation period when the babies are shedding off those viruses. And then again, you can see viremia over here. So viremia and all the symptoms basically are a part of viremia, except, except, uh, we call it three C's. You can see three C's over there. So some of the viruses, because they affect the sensory system, so they will 
they will give you a cough, first C for cough, second C for conjunctivitis, so your eyes will become very sensitive, because conjunctiva is very sensitive, second C, and the third C is coryza. And uh, many times we add P as well, because you may have photophobia as well, so you kind of get blurry vision, because it's a disturbance of your sensory system. And then again, you can see rash comes later. So rash comes later. So this is the whole sequelae of especially for measles viruses. Okay, but again, uh, if you keep that in mind, uh, most of these viruses, especially paramyxoviruses, are going to uh, act in a similar way. Okay? Uh, there is one more thing which is clinically very important. It's called complex parts. I'm going to show you. I've got some picture for you to look at. It's called complex parts. There's parts in the oral mucosa. Now, if you look at uh, the immune response in terms of uh, the whole sequence, you can see days after infection. So you will see your, uh, we call it virus load. Remember? Because that's what I was trying, if you delay the therapy for any viral infection, so you built up virus load. So the more load is, the more it will travel. So you have to put a stop on that. That's the whole, whole idea. That's why most of the time acyclovir has to be initiated within 72 hours of the first symptoms. If you don't do that, there's no point even giving after 72 hours. You can see from there, because the viral load has phenomenally increased. It goes from your respiratory uh, epithelium to lymphatic blood spleen, and then when you see it, it's already too late because it's gone to the skin, and that kind of plateaus off and then comes down. And then again, uh, as I said earlier, three C's uh, with one P, triple C P, that's what we call clinically. Uh, P basically is photophobia. So the, of course, adults can tell you that vision is fussy and you know, is, is, is not clear, but what about the babies? They're gonna tell you that they cannot see properly. Now, if you look at the immune response, again, a typical immune response is that you will have uh, CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells coming immediately to fight off the infection. And then again, the first antibodies to appear are IgM, if you wanna run a test, and then IgG will come later on. Measles is a serious febrile illness. Many times in viral infection, you get a mild fever, but this is a high fever thing. Again, you can see we talked about that. So you have prodromal symptoms, and then this, I'm gonna show you uh, some of the clinical pictures. You can read it on your own. I think I pretty much have described that, uh, uh, especially for the rash. I'm gonna go through the complex parts, and you can see from this whitish parts on the inside of the mucosa. So they are very classical things. So you, uh, there was a time when um, there were no tests. We used to reply, rely totally on these complex parts, the whitest discharges there. And then again, you can see measles rash. It kind of goes all over your body. So it's not like an isolated, not like a dermatome, right? How do you control it? You have to have a live attenuated vaccine. It could be given, or if you wanna give after the exposure, passive immunization, we can give immune globulin. What is MMR? Uh, they are all live attenuated viruses. The viruses have been attenuated, meaning that they have lost the ability to cause disease. But again, uh, keep in mind that they have lost the ability to uh, cause disease, but if your immune system is not good enough, you have AIDS, you have immunodeficiencies, then even you may have a problem with a live attenuated vaccine, like HIV patients. So these are the strains you don't have to remember. Uh, efficiency is 95%. Again, people will argue that I have had a vaccine. What, do I still get the problem? Yes, you do. So 5% of the people still get infected. We are still working on that. Uh, awareness, again, uh, for uh, people around the area, you can see that uh, we must move faster. That's a key for viral infection. Things have to be expedited. Uh, if you don't do that, especially for the babies, uh, that will be a problem. And then again, WHO, you can see from the bottom, CDC, United Nations, UNICEF, 
and World Health Organization is still fighting measles and rubella all over the world, and they have tried their best to vaccinate people. You can see they have vaccinated billions of people. Okay, mumps, again, uh, when you think of mumps, you think of parotid gland. So this parotid gland on the side, they are uh, sublingual glands. The moment you see inflammation, pain, any person reported a swelling of mumps, a swelling of parotid glands, parotitis, there's no other diagnosis than mumps virus. It's so common. That's why, uh, especially, and very debilitating as well, I'm going to talk about. The problem with the mumps virus is that the babies who have mumps virus, uh, if they are male, they will have uh, sterility forever. If they are female, they will have sterility forever. So mumps virus is important, and you have to act fast, otherwise it will destroy their germinal centers of producing eggs or sperms. So that's an important thing for mumps virus. Enveloped virus, again, contagion periods precede symptoms. You may be asymptomatic, shedding it. And a uh, good thing is only one serotype exists. Immunity is lifelong. And again, I, I told you that you really have to qualify that sentence. We have a uh, defense mechanism. But the, number th the most important thing that mumps virus, uh, which people are going to ask you, that infection of the parotid gland. Right? I'm going to show you some picture as well, that uh, the moment you see the parotid gland inform, inflamed, immediately you should be thinking for the uh, testes in males and ovaries in females because they will be permanently damaged if you don't act in time. And again, CNS is important. Uh, principal symptom is swelling of parotid gland. Cell mediated immunity is important. Antibody is not sufficient, and I gave you the reason for that because antibody is not sufficient because the virus will have to go out of the cell to be exposed to antibody. Mechanism of spread in our condition for respiratory tract, viremia, and once it gets systemic infection, you have yet another complication which I failed to remember earlier. But again, uh, there are some reports that I myself get, would get panicky if I look at any parotid gland uh, swelling or any person reporting that because the speed which, which this virus divides into parotid gland is phenomenal. It's phenomenal. And uh, I was talking to someone as well that there have been outbreaks, especially uh, in communities, in the colleges, in the universities. And the moment it goes into your blood, it's going to go for your testes ovaries, peripheral nerves, eyes, inner and central nervous system. And guess what? They all are, have richly supplied with blood vessels and sensory neurons. And the other thing is that, uh, again, again it, if it goes and hits your pancreas, then you will have diabetes. So one of those uh, malignant viruses that you have to be very careful because the reports are coming out that you may have a juvenile onset of diabetes. Incubation period is 14 days, so you may keep this infection for 14 days and shedding off the virus before you actually see the actual swelling of parotids. So this is already there. That's another problem for any viruses that have a long incubation period. So you can see from here, uh, parotitis, architis, uh, recovery of viruses. These people will shed off virus from their mouths, from, from their salivary secretions. And sometimes they have got the blockage of their ducts as well. And then again, uh, if you look for uh, the antibody response, you will see virus-specific antibody pre pre present, and you should be tested for that. I mean, I, I usually teach that and say that, but I wonder uh, many a times uh, what's the normal practice is that uh, it also depends upon the health care we provide to the people. So we teach something, but when it comes to the doing, especially in ER, for example, so you will have uh, somebody not doing the test at all. But we teach that once you see that, you have to take serious. It depends upon the healthcare. And uh, I myself went to an ER once, and they were more interested in looking what kind of insurance do I have as compared to what symptoms do I have. So that was a bad. So, they are, so that's why it takes hours for people to figure out, you know. But nevertheless, 
this is the commonest cause of sterility in women. Bumps. So if you investigate a case that uh, they have orchitis, uh, they have menstrual problems, they have, you know, eggs not be released. If you take their history, they may have had mumps when they were small. Okay. This is how it looks like, especially clinical illness in the babies, parotids on the both sides. You have to do lab diagnosis. You can go for saliva, urine, or secretion and the uh, clinical diagnosis can be confirmed by antibodies. How do you treat? Again, uh, vaccines are there, available, as I said earlier, everybody should get this vaccine. Uh, and now, I think what they're trying to do, especially for the increasing number of immigrant population who come up with the certificates uh, for uh, vaccination schedule, they want to go and look for the the antibodies, so they want to look at the teeter of the antibodies that they do have those protective antibodies, otherwise they may want to re-vaccinate them. Uh, Para-influenza virus, again, uh, there are different types. We basically are concerned uh, with, the, with these viruses in a way that it does cause serious respiratory tract disease, especially for the babies. And the, if you look at the influences, keep that in mind. Difference between hemophilus influenzae, and you'll see some of the questions like that. So there are different influenza, hemophilus influenzae, para influenzae. They're all different things. They're all different things, and uh, they have a prevalence. They come and go different time of the year. If you look at the electron micrograph, this is how they look at, look like. Uh, there are four seeder types, but the good thing is that. Uh, these viruses do not cause viremia. So I'm going to ask you a question from this lecture. Which of the following virus cause viremia? And guess I already told you the first two cause viremia, and this does not. OK? Again, uh, the picture is the same. You have those uh, fusion proteins outside, matrix protein. And one important thing you can see from inside is that, uh, as I said earlier, some of the viruses will come with the Polymerase, so they have their own enzyme. They don't rely on your enzyme to replicate the genetic material. So they will come up like, for example, a large polymerase complex. And we talked about, especially for HIV as well. Okay? <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> it is an enveloped virus, so I don't have to repeat it over and over again. I think you must have got it by now that uh, what is the difference between, all you need to know is that whether the vi virus is naked or it has an envelope. And you can pretty much figure out what is going on in those. Upper respiratory tract infection, especially uh, uh, the upper bronchioles. So we have, we call it uh, bronchiolitis. So bronchioles especially are important, especially for the kids. If you look clinically, uh, the most important thing for, uh, for this kind of uh, viruses is that uh, they have like croup. So that's like a barking cough that you normally see. And then again, epiglottis in the back, which is like a valve, get infected and get infl in inflamed. If you look at the lab diagnosis, pretty much the same, that you have to look for those specific antibody against those, um, those fusion proteins and those glycoproteins outside. And as far as treatment is concerned, of course, uh, symptomatic treatment most of the time. And uh, unfortunately for the babies, if its epiglottis is so swollen, you may have to intubate. So that's the difference between these viruses and the previous ones. And no life attendant vaccination is available. And I'll just take one minute and finish up with the last one, which is a respiratory syncytial virus. That was the impact slide as well. Pretty much the same group. The only thing is that uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, for most of these viruses, uh, some of the actually um, respiratory viruses, you need to vaccinate mothers in the third trimester, trimester of pregnancy as well to protect the babies. But in some other, the protective antibodies are not protective when it passes to the babies. So this basically is one of those. Uh, natural infection does not prevent infection. The, uh, the problem looks, and I think you must be familiar with that, when we talk of respiratory problem in the babies, 
all of them by the end of the day got plugging of their bronchiole. So if you look at their chest, they all look asthmatic. They, they don't have asthma per se in a sense, but again, if you look at the, uh, the whole pathology, so if it is inflamed, for example, if you can see that there's an inflamed bronchiole, regardless of whether it's because of the spasm of the muscle, so there's a mucosa not being pushed out. So they get the mucosal plugs. And if you, you'll see a typical V's. So if you ask or take these babies, you'll see a typical V's. And that happens for all the respiratory viruses. And again, uh, I don't want you to go in detail, but just keep in mind for all those uh, projections coming out of those uh, especially uh, envelope and that's what causes problems. It is uh, prevalent in younger children, that's why we have a vaccine. I just told you that IgG antibody and selling and uh, again I would not spend much time on clinical features. All the clinical features for any respiratory virus depends the same, is the same thing. The only difference for this particular RSV is bronchiolitis and if you remember in asthma there is a problem with bronchiole so that has a little bit of familiarity with that and if you don't treat in time you may have problem and finally uh, treatment wise I just told you that uh, the other problem uh, for respiratory illnesses is once there's a premature baby so you always have a challenge to treat them because they may have problem with the surfactant production. So there is a plugs over there. They have to put them in incubation. So that's where we may, may need special attention as well. So that's important in terms of especially these viruses. But right now, uh, there is no vaccine per se available other than the I just told you the passive uh, IgG antibody developed by Abbott. But also keep in mind that many a times these antibodies, uh, these vaccines are expensive. And as I said earlier, we teach something, but when it comes to patient delivery, there is always a problem in terms of uh, our health coverage, insurance, and so and so forth. Okay, so I would uh, end here to give you this message that uh, the vaccine table is the one that we normally do, and passive vaccination is there for people who are there. Uh, for example, if you are suffering from uh, uh, some of the problems that you may have in terms of, as I said, the premature delivery, then we have to give you an extra kit. Okay? So uh, I would advise you for the next lecture, probably I just spoke to Dr. 